The key word in our gazing at God's word today is hope. And according to our text, hope that is alive. Hope fulfilled truly animates and hope dashed simply kills. And hope, in my opinion, is a power that God avails to us as his children to live lives that rise well above our situations, circumstances, experiences, until the end in the present life that God has intended for us. And if we would have that vested in each one of us, we would consistently be vibrant and joyous. And that's the end to which we're driving ourselves as we go into God's word this morning. When, dear friend, did you give up your pursuit, a pursuit of something? It could be anything that you are pursuing. Oh, did you observe a friend? Was it somebody else other than a friend who you looked at? And suddenly they stopped in their trust and said, I'm not going that way anymore, I'm not doing this. We know only too well that no person in their right mind will give up a job when they know it is through that that they get their food their clothing, and their shelter. And we know that no person in his right mind will simply say, well, I'm admitted to the hospital. The doctor hasn't told me to go out, but I'm going out anyway. There must be something that steers that. Otherwise, when we are in our right mind, even though it be uncomfortable to be in that job setting, in that hospital situation, we will be patient until the right time so that we don't give occasion to the employer to say, get out, or the hostel to say, well, you took yourself out, see how you treat yourself. But we want anything that will smooth our way to making our lives comfortable and our bodies healthy. But what is richer or better than spiritual health. And hope, if it is put in its right place, just brings us there where we are spiritually healthy and therefore whole and deeply happy because of the God in whom, as Jacqueline reminded us, we have come to plant our faith. The God about whom we sang the numerous song our sister chose, who the moment we put our trust in, never disappoints us. The God about whom we read, the moment we trust him, he gives us living hope that takes away shame, that takes away disappointment, that takes away harm, that gives us an expected and desired end. This is what we are looking at. And there are seven important features that we should look at in order that this hope might come alive in each one of us. Well, you have four sentences before you depicting that, but I'll reduce those four sentences to a single word. And here's the first feature, source. Who is the source of our hope? It is written in the word, living hope, through the God who has begotten us by his mercy, by his grace. God is the source of our hope. And this is not just God. It is this high and exalted God, the sublime and supreme one, equal to nobody distinct to himself, above all creation, superior to all existence, and in control of everything. He doesn't get controlled 
He controls everything. And this God is both holy and honorable. No spotty, no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So nothing impure, nothing unclean. It doesn't even go. Some of us might think, oh, I didn't know this thing. We get surprised that certain things come in our minds, in our words, in our thoughts, and in our feelings. But not so with our God. He's aware of all things. And he either crushes or permits something, sweet or sour. He has that power. And this is the God with whom we have to do. And this God is a help to all needy people. But that's why he says he has mercy. He goes into their situations. He understands. And so you can tell him this is where you are, but this is where you ought not to be. This is where I want to take you, that it may become good for you. We may not quite appreciate the way he does it, because setting our own minds and supposing ourselves to be big brains, we've worked out how we may champion our lives, but surely, as a child, a baby, a son, cannot know its ways better than its parents. Neither can we know any better than the God who has fashioned us. This God is the harbor of all who believe in him. And hence the hope to harbor is to rest in. Just as boats are brought to a place where they can rest, if there's a storm, they get tied. They are safe as long as they remain in the harbor. But if they don't leave the harbor, then they don't show their might, they don't show their utility, they don't show their usefulness, they don't produce anything, so they must live. But they must harbor to be put together and then be made ready for the voyage. We who harbor in Christ have been given God as a source of our hope. But this source also is a supply, for we are told that this God is the one who by his great mercy, now to be merciful is to pity understandingly, to feel sorry with an understanding that has power to pull the pity out of their pitiful state. This is what our God is like. And each one of us can say, who has tasted among the kindness of the Lord, oh, he took me out of my way at the right time. Well, I thought I was doing it, but as I look back now, he could not have called me to himself at a better time than he did. And as I search my life, I only appreciate all the more that he has called me to himself. I don't know how I live without him. By his great mercy. So God pities, God pardons, and God purifies. And this God produces out of us a people for himself. He has made us, those who have now have a living hope, in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who he has raised from the dead, that we also may be raised from our sinfulness and begin to live for the God who has pitied us. And this God has planted in us the very life that is in him and the very life that defeated death and brought Jesus Christ in resurrection power to live, never to be touched by sin or suffering or shame or dishonor or humiliation or disappointment or disgruntlement. But everything that would show He's being well above all of pain and agony and torture and disturbance into the place that is just delight and heaven and goodness and purity and perfection and pleasantness. This God now wants us to partner with himself for he says, gotten us out of ourselves and brought us to this being called Jesus. And the very reason he partners us with him is simply this, that when Jesus is taken out of the world, we may be the presence of God in the world. The God who was with us in Jesus now is the God who is in the world through us. 
Now that is remarkable, but the hope that is sourced in God supplies this relationship. But it doesn't just do that. I want you to notice, thirdly, that there is a sacredness about the whole thing. Because it says here, to an inheritance incorruptible that does not fade away, that is kept safe in heaven for you. Now that's sacred. Right? That is something that belongs to God, is in God, is from God, and is imparted by God. No one else can do it. That's what means to be sacred. That which belongs to God is only executed by God. But it is going to be received by those who are willing to have it. And we're told our great God has given us that. We are co-heirs with God. We are heirs of that which does not rot, that which does not die. We are co-heirs with God of that which does not fade or lose its luster. 32 years ago, Peggy put this ring on my finger. Those elements that are called gold are pegged at about nine. And uh, I can see it still glitters. And it doesn't once go off. Because it's Peggy's way of saying, you are my man, no one else's. And I'm proud of that. But you can, if you look at it very carefully, you will begin to see that the luster that it had at the time I wore it is not quite there now. It's fading slowly. Even though it glitters and you can see that there's genuine gold in there, but it's not quite the same spark that it was. And yet our God is telling us, we who have trusted him, what he has stopped for us in terms of comfort, in terms of assurance, in terms of peace, in terms of perfection, in terms of blessedness, will not be what we feel while we are here on earth. Oh, I'm not in the right mood today. I was happier yesterday than today. Oh, don't know if I feel the same tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. It's not like that. It is always the point where you say you are who you are unshakable, uh, settled, and sure. And why? Because the source and the supply is this sacred being who doesn't miss his words, who doesn't lose his ability, who sustains what he places himself in, and who keeps to that which he says belongs to him, and will never ever lose it. And this is what our God says, is our inheritance. That hope is not dead. It's living. And finally, notice the salvation. For it says here, kept by God's promise unto a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last day. What is your most treasured possession? Your life? Your wife, your house, your money, your wealth, your fame. What is it? Tell me, which of these will not one day be taken away from you? You have all because you are alive. But we know that even our lives are not in our hands. Then in God's hands. <coughs> Our most treasured possession, we don't control. Somebody says, no, we decided to die. No, we don't decide to die. We simply die because the time has come for us to die. Just as I can say, physical, physical sleep. I mean, I may want to do work sometimes and struggle through the night. And some, someone has told me at some point, hey, you stop doing that and go to bed. But because there's something I want to accomplish now, but you must have done some more. I want to get this done. But my body is saying, no, you can't. Stop and give yourself some rest. So these bodies will come to that point where you don't just this physical sleep, this sleep of death, 
will come to us. None of us will ever resist it. And it's clear. My skin was close to the roots when I was born. But now it's very different. I'm growing old. In fact, when our young babies are born in Africa, the younger ones actually say in the vernacular, European, European. <laughs> Because the skin is so close that they go, this one's still. But as they begin to age, you can see life is pining away. And one day we will sleep the sleep of death. And at that point, our money is useless. Our houses are useless. Our cars are useless. Our friendships are useless. Our spouses are also useless. If you have no hope in the God who is the God of the resurrection, we are wasted. But our God is telling us, it's stopped for us who have believed him, that while we are in this earth, we may realize the substance is not in ourselves. It is in the source of our hope. The power is not in ourselves. It is in the supply of our hope. Our existence is not in ourselves, in the sacred one who remains God unchanging yesterday, today, and forever. And our end is in the salvation that is given by him who is the God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Are we portraying this God, we who say we love him? Are we displaying him and disseminating his glory, his hope, and fading and shattered and wavering, stable and surely awaiting those who trust? And if we have no faith in this God, we will not say today, I want to believe this God and have this hope. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful for your goodness to us that tells us there is life beyond the present suffering and there is life beyond the grave. And that life is all stocked up in you, but it is sourced and supplied in a sacred way for those who seek the salvation that is theirs in your son. And thank you, Father, that in this house are such as those, and if they are lingered amongst us, some who have not tasted and known his kindness, may this very day they be helped to come to faith in Jesus and to this living hope. And thank you, Father, that we can seek your help in taking a stand that speaks your presence in us. And now hear us as we sum up our plea before you. In the very words that Savior himself taught us that in this way we should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as if we forgive those who trespass against us. And make us not into temptation. But to the evil, for the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Where do we go from here, Martha?